as an engineer, I came to realize, having been lazy for many years, that the average person gets very poor information from the media, in the United States at least, uh, about energy, about climate change, and so forth. And that's how really I got involved with uh, the thorium issue. Uh, so in order to try to correct that, I started working with local groups. I'm a Sierra Club member, I'm an NRDC member, I'm a, well, I was a physician for social responsibility member until they start, started going crazy, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But uh, the point is that the average person only gets maybe a sound bite or a video bite uh, from the media about things. And Fukushima, for instance, is a great tragedy to a lot of people and an opportunity to destroy nuclear power uh, if they don't like it. It's a beneficial thing for nuclear power because it shows if you do stupid designs, something bad will happen even after 40 years. Because a friend of mine was GE's first nuclear safety engineer and he worked on the Fukushima plant and they would have meetings with the TEPCO officials and engineers and they would all nod their heads and long meetings and say, oh yeah, we'll do this, we'll do that. And then they'd go off after the meeting and do whatever they wanted. And that's why you had a 15-foot seawall with a 45-foot wave coming over it. <laughs> and diesel generators and fuel in the basement. I mean, you know, that has nothing to do with nuclear power. It has to do with bad management. I'm sure you can talk to the Japanese representative here about TEPCO's management getting kicked out years ago for fraud and other things. I mean, they've, they've had a history. So at any rate, I, I view Fukushima as an excellent opportunity to discuss with people who are skeptics what, uh, what nuclear power isn't and you wouldn't even design a, 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 a simple factory the way that was designed, right? So that, that's, that's a good example. At any rate, this, this is the other thing I want to make sure people read. That's a document that JFK asked for from the AEC in 1962. And in that document, it explains what we were supposed to do with nuclear power. We totally screwed up. We still run the kind of reactor they said you could start with, the boiling water or pressurized water reactor, because it was available. It was Hyman Rickover's nuclear submarine reactor. It was a technology they could reproduce economically. But it also says we should be running breeders, doing the research and running breeders. And by the year 2000, we should have something like 700 gigawatts of thorium or U-238 breeder reactors running. Now, 238, as you see, we, don't, we make plutonium with, we don't want to do that. So we should have already been solving our problem with energy in the United States. And it's only been 49 years, right? <laughs> so, so we need to actually get working. The next thing is uh, the book by Alvin Weinberg. If you want to see exactly what has happened over the years since 19, 40s when he was working with the Manhattan Project and so forth. He and a fellow named Murray held a basic patent and designed for the kind of water reactors we use currently. And that patent is 65 years old in a month. So we have 65 year old technology that we have been sort of depending upon as nuclear technology, which has nothing to do with what we should have been doing according to what Kennedy and Congress were told in 1962. So that, is also, that book is available on Amazon for 13 bucks. You should definitely read it because it will educate you clearly about how nuclear power has gone wrong in the United States over the last 60 years or so. When we did Apollo 13, we had guys who knew what they were doing when the black swan or the unexpected happened. And in fact, the way a thorium molten salt reactor could be controlled when everything fails is the same way when I went to Lehigh in Pennsylvania, right across the street was Bethlehem Steel, largest steel plant in the world. And they would empty the open hearth furnaces very simply. Guy would stand on the other side of the factory floor with a World War II bazooka and he'd blow the side, uh, the wall that they had cemented up for the open hearth open and the steel would flow out. So you could do that. You could always have a bazooka ready in a molten salt reactor site so that if it's all gonna run out, downstairs. If you're worried about one bazooka failing, you could have 20. <laughs> Just have to find somebody who's willing to walk into the building and do it. Or can run faster than a, faster than a neutron. <laughs> the point about this, Apollo 13 was a very difficult problem. It was a typical governmental problem where the filter, the CO2, 
removal uh, machi uh, machinery was different in the command module from the lunar lander, and they had to retreat to the lunar lander and figure out how to reconstruct a CO2 removal tool, otherwise they'd suffocate to death. That was the real, one of the real challenges. They actually did the right thing. They spent time doing the research and, and, and at, the, at the site in real time, engineers being heroes in that, in that case. And Kranz, Gene Kranz is the guy who said, you know, failure is not an option. Well, we have a situation worldwide now where we've been performing an experiment on Earth, a chemistry experiment on Earth's atmosphere and oceans for a hundred and some odd years, burning fuel that produces carbon dioxide, among other things. And that's very un unnatural. It's not something that has happened in, at the rate at which it's happened before. 2009, fall of last year, this chart came out from the Copenhagen uh, group. It was presented to the Copenhagen meeting uh, for them to help make a decision about what to do internationally about global warming, and they did nothing. They took the science and pretty much ignored it. Given that we've wasted so much time in dealing with global warming, we've had warnings since Arrhenius in 1896, 1905, that burning fuel, and he didn't have oil to worry about then because we didn't really have oil very much then in 1896. We haven't listened for a hundred and some odd years. Now all of a sudden we're still, you know, spinning our wheels, but we're getting more serious about it, at least the rest of the world is. So based upon the assumption that we're willing to sacrifice 160 million people's lives to sea rise, climate change, and so forth, if we're willing to only sacrifice 160 million people around the world due to the effects of excessive CO2 emissions, then here's what we need to do. We need to, on 2011, start reducing CO2 emissions by 4% a year. January 2011. Well, are we doing that? Act not, right? If it's like an IRA or a 401k that you decide that you don't decide until you're almost ready to retire to put money into. Every year that we wait, we have to reduce emissions faster in order to deal with saving 160 million people. So obviously something like thorium and molten salt reactor and so forth addresses as quickly as we can this kind of an issue if we can get it done. What we would need to do is to build and operate a one gigawatt reactor every Tuesday from now until 2060, or every Wednesday, or you pick a day of the week that you would like. But that's the debt that we have now in terms of already produced CO2 emissions in the atmosphere <clears throat> and the ocean that we have to start immediately correcting. And we're not doing that yet, so it means that very soon the debt will be increase will increase it's increasing continually so that the demand for power that doesn't emit is going to be even more severe twice a week we have to build one of those plants pretty soon these lines indicate what the goal is also based upon population which is the 800 or 1000 pound gorilla in the room that nobody wants to talk about the forecast is for 9 billion in the, on earth by 2050 if you read Weinberg's book, they were worried about having 12 to 20 billion people by about that date. And that's why they were concerned, because they knew about global warming even in the 1960s, late 60s. So they were concerned when they were designing the reactors, the molten salt reactor in particular, with not only stopping burning materials that we could use, like petroleum and coal, but also starting to reduce the production of CO2. And so they were aware of that, you know, 30, 40 years ago. This is not news, just as Arrhenius was aware of, of the possibility uh, 100 years ago. If we have 9 billion people, then we need to get down to an emission level of one ton of CO2 per capita per year. One ton. That's 100 gallons of gasoline. If you drive your car and use 100 gallons of gasoline, that produces a, a ton of CO2. We can all pretend to be global warming deniers because that's probably not going to be the main problem. The main problem, because of all the CO2, is that 40% of it in the last 200 years or so that we've burned something is in the ocean. And CO2 makes carbonic acid in the ocean, and that's what Arrhenius's paper in 1905 dealt with. These animals that provide the base for the entire oceanic food chain, plankton and so forth, form skeletons out of carbonate
ions in the water formed from carbon dioxide in the water. But if the pH of the water becomes too acidic, they can't, calcite will remain in solution. It will not come out of solution. They cannot therefore build their skeletons. If the plankton fail, as they're already being observed to fail off the Nordic coasts in the North Atlantic, then the entire food chain on the Earth's oceans can fail because they are the base of the food chain that everything else eats. All right, so that's a serious, that's a, that's a serious issue. And since we're already measuring pH changes that are very significant, we, uh, we need to do something. Uh, this is the, ty the type of energy that we have to consider that we have available to us. We have energy that's natural in form, derived energy, unnatural forms. Unnatural forms of energy are what we exploit. And energy is really a relative quantity. It depends upon having something in relation to something else. Like if I lift this up a certain height, it has a certain amount of potential energy in relation to what will happen when it hits this piece of wood, right? So it, energy is not necessarily something that's, that is an absolute. It has to do with the mass and the relationship between entities. The top one comes from the Lewis Group at Caltech a couple of years ago where they analyzed sources of energy that are available. As you can see, the solar input from the sun. In one hour, we get a year's worth of total human energy consumption. In a day, we get 24 years worth of solar energy that we could exploit. So if you don't know what a ton of CO2 looks like, and most people don't, I certainly didn't, here's 20 kids' balloons blown up. A pound of CO2 is 220 of those balloons. So that means a ton of CO2 is 440,000 balloons like that. Now, the average New Yorker produces 10 tons of CO2. That's 4.4 million of these balloons every year. The average Denverite produces twice that. So the huge volumes of CO2 in the atmosphere are produced for every ton of combustion product that's produced. And so it's a greenhouse gas, and that's part of our problem with global warming. But it's, it also is changing the chemistry of the ocean, and that is the most quickly occurring problem. Sea rise is also a problem, but it's a little slower problem to have to deal with. We are here at this level. We used to be up here, and before that there. So what we're dealing with here is that we're very close to the point. We're 0.1 pH, we chemists will understand what that means, away from our source of food in the ocean not being able to live the way it normally did. Industry is lobbying against cap and trade, that kind of thing. Well, cap and trade has been used and actually works in the United States. The lower picture is what we used to do. I'm from New Jersey, New Jersey originally. We used to get acid rain from everybody in the Midwest, burning coal and so forth. And, and before a cap and trade system was developed for sulfate emissions, it looked like this acid rain problem uh, trees were dying in forests and that kind of thing. Cars were getting their paint eaten off. And now with the cap and trade system, it's much, much better. So we know that cap and trade system can work for something. We could do a CO2 cap and trade. First thing to remember is whenever we burn something, we're using a very inefficient process. Thermodynamics typically gives us about 30%, 33% of the energy when we burn fuel. So that's why your car doesn't go 60 miles on a gallon if we waste 30% of that 35 kilowatt hours. Simply burning fuel in a typical engine is, is not good because we're wasting as heat out the exhaust pipe. So every time you put a dollar's worth of gas in your car, just kiss 60 cents or 66 cents of that goodbye because it's going to go out the exhaust pipe as heat. Right. So that's the problem with combustion. So anybody who's trying to sell you biofuels or this kind of thing, ask them the question, what do you do about the thermodynamic inefficiency of combustion engines? It doesn't really make any sense. In the middle is fission energy, hundreds of thousands of times more than the best combustion energy in terms of energy density. So the important thing, which I, I try to bring to people, particularly folks in the environmental organization, is if you're concerned with the environment, then you want to be aware of what the energy density or the power density of any source is that you're going to advocate 
people switch to or use. Well, the energy density of fuels that you burn is down in here. Even hydrogen used as a fuel will be just toward the right end of this orange section, but you have to expend energy to get the hydrogen in the first place. So when you put the whole budget in there, it doesn't really work out very well. If you move up to fission, you've got hundreds of thousands more watts per square foot, per acre, per pound, whatever. And if you move up to fusion, you get another 10,000 times that. Fusion we don't have to wait for because fission is good enough for us, particularly with the thorium cycle. When you are reading all these things about green power this, green power that, they are all way down here. A wind turbine, which is not really a turbine, but a windmill, a windmill five megawatt top of the line Siemens windmill takes 10 acres. Now five megawatts per 10 acres, that's half a megawatt per acre. A nuclear plant's hundreds of times that. A coal plant is far bigger, even better than that. A solar panel is better than that. And in fact, in uh, California the, recently, we were able to succeed in getting what's called community choice, where communities can decide where they're going to get their power from. They don't have to buy it from the utility, which is, makes the utilities very angry. So that leads to what's called the distributed generation, and you may hear the term DG. So that means that you can have on your house or your business or whatever your solar generators and tie into the grid and the grid has to accept you. And, and now we have a very robust grid. It doesn't depend upon a power line getting knocked down that goes from Oregon to California, that kind of thing. Everybody is an island if they want to be. If, they, if there's a damage to some area of town, the rest of the town can operate. It's that's that simple. So DG is one of the key features, I think, of the future. Sustainable energy, solar energy locally, and for the main generation, base load 24 hour, 24 seven would be nuclear, preferably the thorium molten salt reactor. And then the other thing is, of course, we waste so much that we have a very easy time of getting a lot of energy with not doing nothing except economizing. In California, we waste 58% of everything that's generated, 58%. And we waste 10% of what's generated in transmission lines. So whenever they talk about these remote solar farms or remote wind farms or anything, just say, okay, you're, you have a debt of 10% that you're paying from now on forever because that's what you're wasting. You're never gonna get that energy back. Okay, thanks. So the key thing I would like everybody to think about is energy density of the source. And fission is an excellent source in terms of how many acres you have to devote. And this includes mining and waste disposal. So that's where the waste issue with thorium comes in as being superior, where the mining, we don't have to mine anything because there's a thousand years worth of thorium in the Lemmy Pass mine between Montana and Oregon. And that mine is a 1400 acre plot, right? It's a college campus. It's got a thousand years of energy for all of the United States. It's really silly to worry about something else.